welcome to another edition of Hometown Histories. I'm Dallas Grove. Almost 80 years ago, in 1939, a German ship, the St. Louis, was turned away from our shores, and over 900 Jewish passengers were forced to head back to an uncertain fate. Today, we'll hear from a passenger on that ship, Eva Wiener, too young at the time to remember that journey, but determined it will never be forgotten. Well, thank you, Eva, for being here tonight. Um, it's very, very good to talk to you on a most important subject to you and to the rest of us. And I'm eager to talk to you about your longtime connection to Wanamassa and Ocean Township, but we'll do that in a while. I want to start with your story. Uh, tell us about what brought your parents together in Germany. I'm going to start by saying that when they met in Berlin, both of them had been immigrants from Poland in their early years, in their childhood, and met in Berlin. But by the time they met, something known as the Nuremberg Laws had been put into effect, which made life for Jews in Berlin very, very difficult. Um, businesses were only permitted to do business with other Jewish people. A uh, Jewish doctor, for example, could not treat patients other than Jewish patients. Mm. Uh, the Nuremberg Laws were very, very emphatic uh, about discriminating against Jews. Uh, Jewish children were no longer allowed to go to public school. So life in Germany was already very difficult. Uh, so that by the time my parents met, some of my father's family was uh, very upset with the atmosphere and decided to leave. Mm -hmm. um, my father's parents, a brother and three sisters, in 1936 or 37, uh, left Berlin and went to Palestine, which is mm -hmm. now Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, so my mother had not the opportunity to meet some of my father's family. Um, the problem was that life in Germany was difficult to say the least and people were trying to leave but many countries were denying them entry. Even at that early time in the uh, mid-30s? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It was very difficult to find a place for safe haven uh, for those people leaving Germany. Uh, many countries had quarters uh, of whether they were Jews or not Jews, of immigrants from other countries. Mm -hmm. So it was very difficult. Uh, and my parents, although they um, got married in 1937, um, were already affected mm -hmm. by many of these laws. What started happening that brought the world's attention uh, to the situation? I know there was a particular night uh, that's gone down in history. Yes. Uh, it's known as Kristallnacht, or a night of broken glass, and that was in November of 38. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that basically was the beginning of the war. And the following day, my father was taken out of our apartment and put on the train with hundreds of other men and sent back to what was called the country of origin. Since my father was born in Poland, he was being sent back to the capital of Warsaw, uh, with hundreds of other men. Um, and he found himself in Warsaw sharing a one-bedroom apartment with 12 other men. Mm. But the difficulty was that he left his wife and baby, and that was me, behind in this apartment in, in Berlin. And not knowing what his fate was going to be, or where he was going to end up, uh, and what our problems were going to be. Such as support, how would you be supporting yourself? So exactly. the crunch was not only him being away, but the uh, how did you and your mother make out? Well, my mother found out that if she were able to get a visa to another country, and of course I have to, when I speak to kids, I have to expa explain what the word visa means. In children's terms, visa is like MasterCard, and right. I have to explain to them it's right. not, not that kind of a visa. Uh, so I explain the, re the meaning of the word visa in this context. Permission but, to enter another country. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's a, a piece of paper issued mm -hmm. by a country permitting you to enter that country. 
So my mother found out that if she could get a visa to another country, my father would have permission to come back to join her on the condition that they leave immediately. So it was a, a tiresome process. She would stand on lines of any consulate in any embassy that found itself in Berlin, uh, sometimes for days on end, mm -hmm. begging and pleading with any country that would issue a visa. As a matter of fact, my mother was issued a visa to a place called Siam. Oh. Now, you and I know what, what Siam was Time and is today, today. Yeah. but of course the children look at me with blank stares like, right. what is Siam? Uh, so it, again, I explain that it used to be, uh, much like Palestine is now Israel, Siam is now Thailand. Mm -hmm. But Thailand is the kind of country uh, it's found near Japan and China in the Far East, and not a very highly developed country, what we call a third world country, mm -hmm. uh, where indoor plumbing is hard to find, uh, not a very developed nation. But it didn't matter because now she had a piece of paper that permitted her to leave Germany and go, to, go somewhere else, right. possibly for safety. Mm -hmm. Therefore, my father was able to start his journey from back, back from Warsaw into Berlin. Very enterprising of your mother when a lot of other people apparently were not availing themselves of this. They, they, they felt that staying was a, um, oh, I guess, a, an act of faith, that things would get better. Interesting that you should say that, because my father was one of eight children, and one of his sisters was determined that this man, Hitler, was a madman, and nobody was going to follow him, and nobody was going to listen to him, and all this stuff is nonsense, and it'll all blow over. So the family business was a bakery, and she was determined to stay on and run the bakery, and then when it was all over, everybody would come back and business would be as usual. I see. But she had the forethought to send her only son on a kinder transport, which was a mobilization of a British enterprise that would take children out of Germany and at that time Austria as well and save them in London, in England. So she decided to send her son on the kinder transport uh, to safety, but she was determined to stay on and run the business. So there was this psyche in many people that this would all blow over. Mm -hmm. um, my parents did not feel that way. Mm -hmm. They were anxious to leave. As a matter of fact, my mother's brother, who was in Cuba, had gone there two years prior, uh, she had sent him money asking him to get a visa to Cuba. Uh -huh. So that now she had the visa to Siam, which permitted my father to come back. But the papers for Cuba came in the interim. Mm -hmm. So then making a decision as to whether or not to go to Siam or go to Cuba was not much of a decision to make. <laughs> uh, certainly Cuba, the, the paradise that it was, uh, destination vacation island, uh, only 90 miles away from New York and I mean America. Uh -huh. And uh, those were the two primary reasons for deciding to eliminate the, the, the trip to, to Siam. <laughs> My mother was able to book passage on the St. Louis, and my parents packed what few belongings they were permitted to take, and only allowed to take one suitcase per person, um, only a minimum amount of cash, and we boarded a train for Hamburg, Germany. And that's where this beautiful cruise ship was docked. You say beautiful cruise ship. Um, I think people probably might have an image of you're being loaded like on a, uh, a cattle car or something like that. On the contrary. On the contrary, huh? This was a, a cruise ship and had been used as a cruise ship to the Bahamas and what have you over the years. Um, and we booked that ship. There was a flourish on the dock. There were batters flying and a band playing and, and photographers running around taking pictures of everybody. Now you learned this later because you were uh, an infant at the exactly. time. Well, a toddler, I guess. 
Yeah. I was ten, ten months. I was okay. ten months old. Right. <laughs> I was the youngest girl on the ship. Uh -huh. There was a little boy who was two months younger than I. But uh, my mother used to tell me I was the youngest because she never met the other little boy. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't meet him until well after the voyage. How could you we get had a, a, We had a, a reunion many years ago, mm -hmm. and I had the honor of meeting my 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 little kid kid brother. We okay. called him. Right. Yeah. Um, but it it's not the thing that I have conscious recollection of. Right. But my parents told me all about it. It was my curiosity. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. And they were sharing in, in uh, the story and how they felt and how they um, reacted mm -hmm. to the situation. But much of what we had learned afterwards, they were not aware of. Mm -hmm. We did not really find out the significance of the ship until many, many years later. Uh, in our family, it was just part of our history. You didn't Something know the whole we did. world was watching. Exactly. Actually. Yeah. Uh -huh. No idea whatsoever that this ship had any significance. We did not know that this ship had been carefully selected by the Nazi propaganda machine to show the world what their ultimate goal was, to eliminate Jews. And how would putting you on a luxury ship accomplish that and sending you off to the New World? They had predetermined with the Cuban government to not allow the ship to dock. They had placed their agents in to the government of President Brew, the president of Cuba, and told him in no uncertain terms that you will not allow these people to come in. President Brew, being a very corrupt individual to begin with, had no problem saying no to the docking of the ship uh, for several reasons. Number one, his arch enemy was the one who issued us our visas, our land, we call them landing permits, and he pocketed the money from them, which were very expensive, by the way. And President Brew didn't receive any remuneration for that. Mm. And that wasn't very pleasant. He, <laughs> so we had no problem in saying that the papers that we are holding are worthless. Oh, dear. Um, there were some people on the ship who had been issued visas by other people. Uh, some of them were government employees. Others just bribed the right people. Mm -hmm. It was a very corrupt mm -hmm. government. And so 20 some odd people were able to get off the ship. But the rest of us who held the permits that were issued by this one gentleman uh, were declared to be worthless paper. Mm -hmm. My goodness, that must have been shocking. Just but shocking with all the expectations and the hopes. It was all pre-planned though. Yes. Uh -huh. the, but you didn't know. Of they, course your parents so. didn't of course know. So. Yeah. The, um, the headlines in the German newspaper when, when we left Hamburg read 937 Jewish passengers leaving on this beautiful cruise ship. No one is stopping them. Good riddance to them. We're getting rid of them. And that was the, that was the whole premise at that point, is just right. to eliminate from, the, from Europe the presence of the Jews. They didn't care how you got out of there, just go. And they were proud of the fact that they were allowing this shipload of Jews to leave with no restraints. But the minute we got to Cuba, knowing that we weren't going to be able to get off the ship, the same headline in the German newspaper read, Jews arrive unable to land. Nobody wants them. We will do the world a favor. We'll eliminate them for you. Oh, my goodness. So it was a precursor to what the German Nazi regime was planning. Once having been uh, turned away at uh, Cuba, uh, the ship then uh, approached the United States. Yes. Uh, again, Cuba's only 90 miles away from yeah. Florida. And the captain, who was an incredibly empathetic man, did not 
support the Nazi uh, philosophies at all. And he said, well, I'm going to try to land the ship in Florida. So we turned the ship around and headed towards Miami. But the minute we got close, the United States Coast Guard came out and threw us out of American waters. My dad used to say, we got so close to Miami that you could almost read the license plates on the taxis on Ocean Avenue. That's how close we were to America, and we couldn't get in. Heartbreaking, just, just heartbreaking. <clears throat> what, happened, uh, what happened next? Did you say the captain was very sympathetic? He promised, and I remember my mother saying that he promised that he would not take the passengers back to Germany. Mm -hmm. He would do anything in his power. Uh, he would even beach the ship and set it ablaze if necessary because he knew that if he took his passengers back to Germany, they would not survive. Mm -hmm. And he was really our savior, no question about it. There were um, underlying um, influences, both I guess in Cuba and in the United States, that the Depression was railing and um, the expectation that there would be an influx of a great many immigrants, mm -hmm. but even though refugees, uh, didn't change their mind about changing the policy at the time, which was a uh, strict quota. The quota was established in 1924, quite a bit prior to this. And it would have been within the president's power to override it. Mm -hmm. And telegrams were sent to the president by passengers uh, and to Eleanor, his wife, uh -huh. uh, begging and pleading for them to take us, um, but they were not even answered. There was a lot of um, underlying uh, propaganda against taking the passengers of the ship within the government. Mm -hmm. There were many anti-Semitic ears that were being given voice. Mm -hmm. I understand that uh, Congress had a bill to allow 20,000 children, uh, Jewish children, into the uh, country, but it failed to pass, or it, it died in committee, or whatever, but it, it never got there. So what you're saying is that the climate was not receptive at all in our country. Not at all. No, not at all. And not just the United States. Right, right. Yes, the United States would have been the best receptor. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly could have absorbed 900 passengers easily in any, in any city. Um, and I talked to the kids about that. The concept of the quantity, I mean, there were only 900 people on the ship. Mm -hmm. Easily absorbed. And I usually refer to their school as you probably have 900 kids in your school. And it's not that many people. And any country could have absorbed 900 people. And realizing that the passengers on the ship were quite well to do. Mm -hmm. We paid a very, very high price for the passage of the ship. Right. You weren't placed on, you weren't put on. Oh, no, we for paid it. cruise prices uh -huh. and paid round trip fare. Uh -huh. Knowing well we were not planning to come back, I see. they required round trip fare. We also paid a high price for our landing permits, our visas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there were many doctors and lawyers and college professors among the passengers on the ship. Uh, there were very prominent people and certainly would have been an asset to any country that would have taken us. True, true. Uh, was there intent to go to Canada? There was, and Canada had the same reaction. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, there's a quotable uh, book that says one is too many, when the Prime Minister of Canada said he, when he would take 900 people, he said, no, one is too many. And he, there's a book written with that title. There, another book that was published and a movie made, The Voyage of the Damned, yes. <clears throat> based on this, <clears throat> this journey that you and your family and the other people on the ship took. As a matter of fact, it was at the time that the book was published that I finally realized that because I was a part of history, I had a message. I never considered myself 
has having anything significant to say about the Holocaust. I didn't consider myself a survivor until the book showed me the significance of the voyage. Mm -hmm. And only because I happened to be on the ship at the time did I feel that I had a message to share. I, I, uh, I would guess that your parents were shielding you from the, uh, somewhat, from, from the details of what was going on as you were growing up. Tell us where you did go. But tell us first where the ship went. You said the courageousness, the courageousness of the captain played a big part in what happened next. There were several countries that he was able to get uh, access to that said they would accept people rather than sending you all back to Germany. Well, there, there, was, there was an organization that was working in, in tandem with uh -huh. the captain. Uh, it was called, the Jewish Agency, it was called. And they actually uh, offered a per capita, per head uh, bounty, so to speak, per person to any country that would take us. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, there were four countries that agreed uh, to take passengers. Now, what's ironic is that no one country said, I'll take 900 people. Mm -hmm. So they divided the passenger list among the four countries. Uh, my father was, I guess, in, in hindsight, was the wisest because he chose England to be asked to be put on the list for England. And many years later, I asked him why he made that decision, considering that when the ship went back to Europe, it went to Belgium, it docked at Antwerp. And on the dock was my father's sister, brother-in-law, and their baby to greet us. And I asked him, why didn't you go to Belgium? I mean, we do deaths. He had a sister living there, and we really had no one in England. Mm -hmm. He said. He was determined to get as far away from Germany as possible. And off England, the continent. Off the England continent. of course, was the biggest distance. And the English Channel might be a buffer uh -huh. between continental Europe and England. Little did he realize that within weeks, Belgium would be invaded by Nazi troops, and France and Holland soon thereafter. It was the wisest choice. It was by far the wisest choice. Although uh, there were air raids and um, bombings yes. in England as well. Were you went, uh, close to that when you uh, had made that uh, decision? Did you? Did your family recall hearing? Oh, uh, I recall. Going? I recall. Oh, being, right? Absolutely. I have explicit memories of being bombed mm -hmm. in London um, when England fought Germany. Uh, it was almost a, a given that bombs would fall almost every night. Uh, Germany was, as the, they called it, the Blitz, uh, bombed to London, particularly, uh, nearly every night. And I spent many, many hours in bomb shelters mm -hmm. uh, under dire conditions. Yeah, and the bomb shelters were community shelters, but they were supposed to house 50 people and you would cram about 200 in and sometimes would be there for the whole night um, for hours on end um, in these very tight quarters. But I can't compare what I went through to what, God forbid, I would have had to have endured had I gone to Belgium, Holland, or France, because many of those did not survive. And, and yet in England, um, all but one person died during the war. I read that recently, and he died in a bomb shelter. So I don't know the statistics, uh -huh. but obviously we were the safest Definitely. of the four countries yeah. to be in, ending up fighting on the side of the Allies, of course. Um, and I'm grateful, mm -hmm. obviously, mm -hmm. uh, because I have met some survivors from the other three countries, from the St. Louis, um, whose lives were nightmares, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. in many cases lost most of their families, uh, so that my life would not have been the same. Right. How, how did your family survive in England? Was your father able to get work? 
My father, as I said, the family had a bakery in Berlin, mm -hmm. so that he was a trained baker. Mm -hmm. uh, he was able to find work as a baker. And my father was an extremely industrious person. Um, he was, he taught himself how to fix radios, and he taught himself how to fix electric razors. So he did a little side business. Uh -huh. um, I remember him going to what was called Guernsey Market, which was like a flea market, uh, and buy old equipment and fix it and sell it. So that's what he did to as being so resourceful uh, to make extra money. And baking was done all at night. So unfortunately, my mother and I were alone most nights. Mm -hmm. um, occasionally, my father would come home in the morning from working all night and find our homes destroyed oh. and looking for us in, in Red Cross facilities and what have you, and constantly moving to new homes, new apartments. But we survived, so. How are you accepted by the, the population then in, in England? Um, overall, it was okay. Life in England was difficult just for everyone. Uh -huh. um, rationing was severe. Uh, we had ration books, and I remember being permitted one egg per person per week mm -hmm. in your ration book. Uh, so that life was difficult. My mother learned to cook with powdered eggs. Yeah, and yeah. You, you, you improvise. What about the language barrier? Um, my parents had difficulty. I was a child, mm -hmm. so growing up, uh, as I went, when I started school, I learned English mm -hmm. without any problem. Uh, my parents, of course, being older, did have the, the language barrier. Mm -hmm. um, but again, my father, being as industrious as he was, was able to find work, and we were able to. And my mother had been a very, very talented dressmaker in uh -huh. Germany, and she was able to make clothing for the local, local women. Oh, and wonderful. so she was yes. able to be a big um, do alterations and, and making clothing and what have you. As a matter of fact, my mother, I think, was the first one that invented a jumpsuit. <laughs> she, she made a, an outfit for me that went over my pajamas and my slippers and had a hood and a zipper up the front. And that's how she carried me as a child over to the community shelter when there was wow. a problem. Wow, of course, never knowing when you need it. Huh? Exactly. Yeah. What news were you getting uh, about the Jews in, in other countries then? Was that widely known or being reported? Not until towards the end of the war. Um, we had an apartment, our last apartment had a single room across the hallway, which was considered part of our apartment. My mother used to rent it. And our last tenant was a gentleman who had come, who had been rescued in Germany and lost his wife and two children there. Oh, so you got first hand So yes. that's when we found out mm -hmm. what was going on. Mm -hmm. So the decision to come to uh, the United States uh, was made after the war. Yes. And uh, how was travel then? Was it harder, or were so many people leaving at that time, or what? Uh, how were you able to get passage on a visa? We didn't until a year later. The war was over in '45. We did not leave London until '46. Mm -hmm. um, we came on a ship called the Gripsholm, um, Swedish America Line, uh -huh. and arrived in New York City on Memorial Day weekend. Oh, it must, must have been quite a sight to sailing into the it harbor. Was, it was magnificent. Just seeing the Statue of Liberty must was, was a, a, an overwhelming sight. Unfortunately, we couldn't get off the ship because there was a dock worker strike. <laughs> so they kept How us ironic. aboard. How ironic. Not only ironic, but a little frightening. I'll bet. Because it was almost like deja vu. Uh -huh. uh, we were not able to get off the ship, but fortunately, they resolved the dock strike uh, at the end of the weekend, so we were able to get off. But a um, little frightening at first, yes. Um, then where did you go from there? Actually, did you have plans, or were you Well, my aunt, my aunt had uh, secured us a room in Queens, but it was too 
late in the season for me to be registered for school. So my mother decided to come for the summer to her other sister who lived in Belmar. So my first experience of America was coming to the seashore at Belmar, New Jersey. That's wonderful. It was a wonderful experience. I learned how to swim in the ocean that summer. My cousin taught me to swim, and that was exciting. Um, after the summer, though, we went uh, to Queens, New York, Astoria, and uh, my parents and I re uh, lived in Astoria the, most of them. How most old were you lives. about then? Um, I had my eighth birthday in Belmont, New Jersey. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yes. Um, had a wonderful, my, my aunt made me a wonderful birthday party. Uh, but um, I started school in third grade. In a story, in a story in New York. And how different was education uh, from England? Was it uh, an easy transition? Um, it was an easy transition as far as scholastics were concerned. I had no problem, you know, fitting into the the curriculum as it was. Um, I had a traumatic experience because whenever I heard a Fire, a fire engine outside, yeah. or a, uh, any an kind alarm. of a siren, yeah. any kind of an alarm. I would be so frightened that I would run into the closet, and the kids couldn't understand why uh. I was so traumatized. So you actually brought that with you. Uh, that was uh, it was yeah. it was frightening until yeah. I learned to distinguish mm -hmm. what a fire bell was and a fire engine and a police car and what have you. Um, it was difficult to realize that there was not going to be an air raid right. and we were not going to be bombed. Um, that was a little traumatic, but fortunately I was able to overcome that. So uh, was your father able to find work here as a Again, baker? as a baker. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And, and did your mom keep... Um... She did. She did alterations for the women in the neighborhood. At that time, uh, they were starting to buy things off the rack, not uh -huh. so much yeah. uh, handmade stuff. So mm -hmm. she, most of her work was done in alterations as opposed to making things from scratch, although she made all my clothes from scratch. Oh, yeah. well, of course. I had a beautiful wardrobe. <laughs> I'll bet yeah. you did. <laughs> I did. I did. So what, what was the transition from um, Astoria to the shore? Oh, the shore was... It was as a permanent place, place, right? A permanent place? Oh, no, it was not a permanent place. My, a place. my father felt that he could not really make a living at the shore. Uh -huh. uh, he felt that there would be much more opportunity for working in New York. And it was true that even though he, when he finally did give up working as a baker, uh, he did one, uh, he did open up a, a trucking business, uh -huh. which is one of the other businesses he owned in, in, Belmo, in Berlin. He had three businesses. My father had a trucking business. He had a uh, boot manufacturing company. Wow. Uh, and he owned a taxi cab. All three very enterprising. I would uh, say so. Jobs. There's and, a lot of opportunities here then that uh, right. we could fit in. Exactly. Wonderful. And these were experiences that he had. So he ended up doing uh, the trucking more than he did baking. He felt that uh, that was more lucrative. Uh, and he felt New York would be a better place to do that in Bel instead of Belmar. Well, how did you meet your husband? My husband um, and my cousin that lived in Belmar. Who taught you to swim. Who taught me to swim, <laughs> exactly. Uh, they were good friends. And my husband was a lifeguard on the beach. Oh, Belmar, wonderful. And I was able to sit and stare at him up at the, <laughs> on the, uh, on the stand, stand, stand on, the beach, on the beach stand, and uh, uh, did not have contact with him for several years because uh, high school and what have you. Um, he went into the military, uh -huh. and we met again after he came out of the army. Oh, and that was oh, the that's one. That's, that's terrific. Yeah. yeah. So then you relocated. Did you relocate? When we got married, we moved to Long Branch. How about we that? We found an apartment in Long Branch. Um, I remember searching from Long Branch to Spring Lake, just uh -huh. anywhere at the shore, and we found an apartment in Long Branch. And uh, after uh, three years, I became pregnant, 
And then we moved to Ocean Township, to Wanamasa, a beautiful <laughs> house in Wanamasa. And I raised my children there. I had two daughters. Both of them went through all the Ocean Township schools. And uh, very happy with, with that. Well, if you're glad you're a local girl. I am. I have become a local girl, yes. And uh, as a matter of fact, my married daughter bought our house in Wanamasa and lives there with my two grandchildren and her husband. Oh, that's so great. we continue the legacy of, of Wanamasa. <laughs> you were an only child? Is your daughter an only child? No, I have two daughters. I have ah. a single daughter also who happens to live in Titten Falls. Oh, so close you're, by. You're very close by. Yes. Uh, that wasn't just it, just raising children for yourself, but you have also kept your quest going about telling the story. I wonder if you'd tell us about that a little bit now. Well, when I realized that the significance of the St. Louis was a foreshadowing, so to speak, of what was to be World War II and the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And I thought that I had a message to bring children, that it was perpetuated by people who ignored hate and bigotry and prejudice and anti-Semitism. And if allowed to fester, this grows into a genocide uh -huh. and can God possibly, God forbid, become another Holocaust. And I have to make children aware of the importance and the privilege they have in living in America mm -hmm. to be able to stand up against hate and against bigotry because it cannot be allowed. It destroys people. Mm -hmm. The Holocaust cost 11 million lives. Actually, the archives are being opened today that show it's closer to 17 million. Wow. And when we talk about millions of people, sometimes it's difficult to wrap your mind around the figure millions. When you think of millions of people, each one of them was an individual. Mm -hmm. They were not soldiers in combat. They were civilians without guns and ammunition and uniforms. They were ordinary people with mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, families, mm -hmm. human beings. And when people can deny that the Holocaust happened, yeah. we have to speak up against that. Because we have proof and we know that it happened. That people were destroyed for no reason other than they were different. Mm -hmm. They might have had a physical disability, they might have had an intellectual disability. Yes. They might have had a different point of view politically, religiously, for any reason. It was not just the Jews who suffered. Yes, six million Jews died. But it didn't stop there, and it never does. When genocides happen, others are involved besides the singled out group. Yes. Millions of, of others were the victims. Jehovah's Witnesses, Catholic priests, the disabled, homosexuals. I mean, the categories go on and on and on of people who were singled out for no reason other than they were different. And, and considered inferior by for the virtue of being different. Well, that's right. Mm -hmm. By the government tagging them Mm -hmm. as being inferior. So how many times have you, uh, would you estimate you, you've given your talk? Hundreds. Hundreds. And, and how many years across the span of how many years? I would say uh, it's been intensely for the last 20. Mm -hmm. I did it sporadically before that as a result of the published publication of the book and the movie okay. Voyage of the Dead. So that's uh, since the mid-70s. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I did it sporadically then, but I was working and full-time parent and, and, and employed. I didn't have the time. But the minute I 
retired from my work at the government, surprisingly enough. I ended up working for the Department of Defense at Fort Monmouth, uh -huh. um, which was an honor. Uh -huh. I, I felt that also uh, as a, an American citizen and selected to be so, I would serve my country also as a civilian employee at the Department of Defense. But when I retired, I had more time to devote. Uh -huh. And I um, have made a concerted effort. Mostly schools? Mostly, uh -huh. yes. But and I've also seen you on YouTube. So that, that some of these um, uh, talks in the schools have been, uh, so uh, our viewers can, can see more. Yes, if you'd like, um, just Eva Wiener's uh, YouTube. I, I do speak to adult groups, yeah. Um, and when I do, I emphasize the fact that it is even though they know more about the story of the Holocaust, their duty is to pass it on to their children and their grandchildren. It's very important because we survivors are not going to be here much longer, and who will speak for us? But hopefully, those that have heard our stories and the stories of other Holocaust survivors will pass the message on to the next generation. And as we were saying before, it's now kind of into the curriculum of the schools, and that's helpful. But that reinforcement of meeting uh, someone like yourself and, and hearing it firsthand, it's not just uh, something they've read in the book in school. It brings it to life. And of course, the children now are, are, are so into screens yeah. whether it be iPad or what have you, um, that they're uh, detached uh, many times from reality. And when they see flesh and blood, right. it does make a better impression, I think, than, than just seeing something on a video screen. Um, although that's beneficial as well. And that will probably be our only means of, of uh, continuing the story is mm -hmm. that way. But uh, I feel that it is, it is my mission yeah. to continue telling the message of, uh, and I, I even use the, the, the bullying of children to oh, equate it with, uh -huh. equated with hate and bigotry. Uh, even as low as bullying is, it can fester and it can grow, and we cannot be bystanders. Uh, and, and watch this happen. What, uh, what questions after you've given your talk are you most often asked? Um, the one question I usually get asked is what happened to the captain? Uh -huh. And that in itself is an interesting story. Um, when he went back to Germany, he was uh, stripped of his commission and really lived the rest of the war uh, in poverty. When the survivors of the St. Louis found that out, uh, they took it upon themselves to support him for the rest of his life. And he has been, has been recognized by the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem as a righteous among the nations. Uh -huh. uh, a year ago, November, I had the opportunity to present a flower to his name in, in his honor with several other St. Louis survivors oh, nice. to honor him because oh. he truly uh, went, abo so. went above and beyond Absolutely. and certainly put him, himself and his family in jeopardy by sticking his neck out and, to help us. And, and thank God he was a survivor himself. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what, what lesson would you like us to learn today? from all that you've been through and, and your mission to get the word out. What, what is the thing that... that, that well, there are two things. Us? There are really two things. Number one, uh, the message of speaking up against hate and bigotry and prejudice, uh, which is vitally important. One must not allow um, a genocide of any sort to happen again. Or unfortunately, many genocides have happened since then and are still happening today. But the second message I have is relevant today with our refugee crises. Mm -hmm. 
I'm very, very passionate about allowing refugees who truly and honestly seek a safe haven. Mm -hmm. How can we, the greatest country in the world, deny them the opportunity to live a peaceful life? Our world is different today, I grant you, that we must be more vigilant. Uh, we have to be sure that those who are seeking refuge mm -hmm. are truly in need of refuge, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. and not here to transform our society or inflict their ideas on our society, but accept our way of living. We have no right to deny them that opportunity. We have the greatest country in the world and certainly capable of absorbing people who truly need a safe haven. If we deny them entry, then let's take the Statue of Liberty out of the uh -huh. Red Lowe's Island because she has no meaning anymore. Um, I think this is one of, one of the lessons I like to leave my children with. Well, you've left it with your children and a good many other people's children and us today at the uh, Ocean Township Museum uh, for us to preserve this as a permanent record of what happened. I'm honored. Well, we are too, and thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and thank you for watching. Join us again next time for another edition of Hometown Histories.